This video is called Dynamism with AE Cans, and just in case you don't know what dynamism means, it is the quality of being characterised by vigorous activity and progress. Today we are at Bancroft Mill in Barn Oldswick, Lancashire, and Alexander is helping with the running of the engine on a steaming day. This is a type of valve gear on a steam engine that most of my viewers are probably not familiar with. This is called Corliss Valve Gear. Corliss Valve Gear has separate valves for the admission and exhaust of the steam. This engine is a cross compound type. It has a high pressure cylinder and a low pressure cylinder. After the steam has done its work in the high pressure cylinder, it exhausts into the inlet of the low pressure cylinder. And that's it for my narration. The rest of the narration will be done by Mr. A. E. Cairns later on in the video. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoy the rest of the video. This engine, these barring engines were quite often very spartan and they took a lot of abuse and for some reason this seems fairly common. This one only has bottom end cylinder drains, no top end ones and no chest drains. So when you start it you have to be extremely careful and judicious and make sure all the bloody water is out of it before you close them up. But these things, sometimes when the engine took a bite and the thing was falling out of gear, these things would reach five, six hundred RPM or even more. This box underneath my feet with the pulley wheel is driven by the engine crankshaft. There's a continuous feed oil pump inside there and it pumps all the oil that runs out of the bearing quite fast. That pump feeds a top reservoir in this which is called an Aquarius. The top window is an oil box which shows an oil level. This will be full of oil, a couple of pints at least. And there are several valves underneath here. Each one is not a drip, it's a continuous oil feed. This Aquarius drains through the starting cock, which just opens the feed to all of those drips. It goes through and out. In this case, there's three of them. In large engines, there could be five or six or seven to get the entire width of the bearing. This is a quite small one. It constantly feeds oil to the bearing, keeps it wet with oil so that there's no metal touching metal, hydrodynamic wedge effect which is more from the rotation than it is being constantly doused with oil. And as it runs out of the bearing, it returns to the box, comes back up, and is put back in the top in just one big cycle. It also gets the eccentrics, a little side pipe, and the eccentrics return the oil in exactly the same way. When starting an Aquarius, it's very important to remember, don't start it until just before you intend to turn the engine. 
because if you start it with the engine sitting for a while, the Aquarius oil level will drop out completely and stop feeding oil. And once you spin the engine, you won't have the oil feed to the bearing until that pump runs it back up again for a few minutes. So only start an Aquarius oil flow right when you're about to begin running the engine. A lot of people ask why these rods are fish belly. That is, they taper toward the middle and they're largest in the middle. Simple reason is, is to prevent bending. When they designed these engines, there were analytics, but not the sort we have today, so their answer for everything was to overbuild. And that's why these machines will, are still running today 100 years later and will be running 200 years from now, conceivably 1,000 years from now, if they're taken care of. But that's why these main rods are often fish belly. The other type you see on more modern engines is one that tapers from the small end to the big end, like this. For those of you who don't know, the layman the small end is the end of the main rod on the crosshead. The big end is the end on the crank. And we should discuss the wedges too, because people, a lot of people don't know about wedges. The moving wedge is the first part of the principle. There are two halves inside the rod end comprising the bearing. One is fixed, the other is movable. The wedge bears against a gib key or sometimes against the back of the movable half. The further down you put the wedge, the further in it moves the movable half and then presses against it. You don't want it tight, you want there to be room for oil flow and not so much room that the bearing knocks. The wedge precisely adjusts the position of the half bearing and as the bearing wears and the hole becomes oval, you move the wedge in to bring it back into the correct clearance and only after 10 or 11 movements do you have to take the halves out and begin to remachine them. Another type of wedge bearing, working the same way as the one I just showed you, is one where the wedge is internal to the main rod end in a cavity and is moved by a set of two screws. It does the exact same thing and here in fact you can see the split line between the two halves and how the wedge interfaces directly with the moving half which has an angled face. A lot of mill men and I are accustomed to oiling moving pieces, but there are some things you just can't get, this being one of them. One thing they tried was what was called a licking oiler, which is where you had an oil cup with a finger on top of it, and there would be another one here with one of these drip cups and a wick, and whenever this would come around, the finger would strike the wick and by capillary action pick up a drop of oil. But the issue with that design was it flung a lot of oil out of the machine, you wasted it and it did not get to the bearing. Another type is a banjo lubricator, which is far superior. This has, as you can see, the oil cup sitting at a fixed position, so the oil is not going to be flung out of the cup, with a line that runs to a radial oiler. Pipe comes from this sort of basin. The oil runs to the outside by centrifugal force and is forced down the pipe and right into the bearing. There are also telescopic oilers for reciprocating parts, where a fixed oil cup like this would come to a hinged pipe which would telescope inside of another pipe going to a crosshead, an eccentric, what have you. This is the governor of Bancroft Mill. It is a flyball governor with an addition. The Looms Patent Indexing Governor can be seen in the mechanism I have my hand on currently. Two ratchet wheels, one right hand and one left hand, are on a shaft. The shaft turns a bevel gear, which spins a turnbuckle in the rod going between the governor counterbalance and the engine valve trips, which can make it longer or shorter depending on what direction the turnbuckle is turned. An escapement consisting of two catches is driven up and down by the reciprocating motion of the engine. A control rod, which is also hooked to the governor in parallel with the main control rod, can bring this escapement into engagement with either one ratchet wheel, the other ratchet wheel, or neither. Because a steam engine is a reciprocating machine, there will be changes in speed over the course of one revolution. A governor will pick this up and hunt up and down. The looms in a mill depend on constant engine speed. A difference of plus or minus 2 RPM on the main engine can seriously affect the weave quality of a loom. Turning the shaft one way or the other by the ratchet wheels will adjust the speed of the engine via valve timing adjustment. But the key is, one ratchet tooth at a time produces a smooth and fine adjustment that eliminates the RPM differences by the governor hunting.
Please take the time to visit my Mainsteam Models website. Click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that you will find it very easy to find other videos that you may like to watch.